I shouldn't have called an exorcist by Reddit user Rat Rotted. It took me about four months to accept that my new house was haunted. I imagine most people would have figured it out far sooner, but not me. You see, I didn't just not believe in ghosts, I was certain that they weren't real. In my mind, ghosts occupied the same category as dragons and unicorns. So what if a two-bedroom semi-detached house was within a 23-year-old's budget? Some people just sell cheap. It doesn't necessarily mean that there was anything sinister going on. Perhaps the previous owners got a new job somewhere else in the country. I didn't even consider the scratching sounds late at night to be anything other than vermin nesting in the walls. I would set traps without giving it another thought. I chalked up the constant feeling of vague dread that permeated the house to some fault with the air conditioning. As soon as I could afford it, I would just pay to have it replaced. All my friends told me that I had a ghost, but I would just laugh it off. John in particular insisted that there was a restless spirit in the house, but if anything, that made me more certain that there wasn't. John believed in everything from psychics to aliens, and he was the kind of person who spends a fortune on crystals and herbs. So, yeah, it took a lot for me to finally accept that there was something off about the house. The first cracks in my comfortable little bubble of certainty came a few weeks ago. I'd been having a rough night's sleep, trapped in a nightmare that I couldn't wake up from. In my dream, I was a med student working in the morgue. The doctors around me were hostile and rude, laughing and jeering at me. They wanted me to put my gloveless hand inside the chest cavity of a little girl and found my terror at the idea highly amusing. The girl's corpse stared at me with open, glassy eyes as the doctors dragged me towards her. The shocking cold as my hand entered her chest woke me up at last. I let out one of those half-asleep screams that you can only produce after waking up from a nightmare. My right hand was still freezing and clammy as if it was still inside the little girl's chest. And when I tried to move it under my covers, I felt resistance. I screamed again when I saw what I held in my hand. A little girl, the same one from my dream, crouched by the side of my bed. She held my hand in hers, and her touch was like ice water. There were tears in her bruised eyes. I was frozen in place, hardly able to breathe as I stared back at her. My stubborn rationality tried to tell me I was experiencing sleep paralysis. I had suffered from it on and off through my teens and knew the feeling well. But this wasn't sleep paralysis. It wasn't my body that froze me in place, but fear. The girl began to disintegrate into a fine mist right before my eyes. She still held my hand even as I felt the pressure ease and the cold subside. Once she was completely gone, my mind reeled with what I'd just seen. The obvious signs of a haunting and how I dismissed them flooded my brain. The scratching, the cheap house, the sense of dread. I had ignored them all. There were other signs too. The sound of crying late at night that I had chalked up to foxes or cats. Doors opening and closing that I had assumed was simply because of a draft. Things not being where I was sure that I had left them, yet I was convinced that it had only been my own forgetfulness. But what did this mean? If ghosts were real, then I could expect to wake up one morning and find dragons roaming the street. Could it be that demons and angels and psychics and all the other things that I would made fun of John for believing in were real too? No, that's ridiculous. Ghosts aren't real. They couldn't be. If you open up that door in your mind, the next thing you know, you'll be buying crystals from some hippie Wiccan. We live in a rational world, and there's obviously got to be a rational explanation. Sleep paralysis. Yes, it had to be. Sure, it didn't feel like the episodes I had had in my teens, but that didn't prove anything. Not all nightmares are the same, so why should sleep paralysis be? I feel somewhat ridiculous now, but that's how my brain worked back then. I was one of those people who steps beyond rationality and into simple denial. At the same time, my denial proved strong enough to get another week of blissful ignorance. John just had to visit and screw everything up. How can you still be convinced that there's no such thing as ghosts? He asks, pointing at the broken vase on the floor. We had been watching football and sharing a few beers at my place when a vase fell off the mantelpiece. It was a large, heavy thing, and the sound of it shattering made us both leap out of our skin. But it was too far big an ornament for it to have been knocked over by a simple breeze. 
John looked at me, and I just shrugged and said it had to be tremors. He said he didn't feel anything and that I was being ridiculous. I was being ridiculous, but I wasn't about to let John tell me that. John, who believed in psychics. John, who believed he could sense the presence of spirits. An idea came to me in that moment. All right then, John, why don't you lead me to the spirit? Use your gift to show me which room the ghost is in, I told him. Well, ghosts do move about a little, he said, suddenly unsure of himself. I've had a drink too, it may not be easy. That's all right, I'm happy for you to take your time. I had called John out on his supposed psychic power and was loving every moment of it. Besides, didn't you tell me once that ghosts manifest most strongly in a particular room of the house? I'd like to know which room that is so I can set up my camera. John wasn't too happy about a skeptic asking him to demonstrate his quote-unquote gift, but the alcohol had made him bold. He accepted my challenge and we spent the next five minutes wandering around the house. John had one hand out in front of him as though he could feel his way to the ghost by touch. Then we reached my bedroom and his little finger twitched. Here, he said at last. The ghost is strongest in your bedroom. I think... I think it's a little girl. My heart stopped. How could he have possibly known what I'd seen in that room? I certainly hadn't told him. Denial kicked in again and I wrote it off as a lucky guess. All right then, I'll set up the camera and see if there's anything here. If I do spot a ghost, I'll buy the first round next time we go to the Red Lion. He chuckled and just simply said, Deal. So that's how I finally shattered my little bubble of denial entirely. I did set up the camera and watch the footage back the next day. I skipped through the first few hours since watching myself sleep wasn't exactly exciting. As the footage went on without a trace of a ghost, I felt a warm sense of smug satisfaction. It was only when I skipped past an odd flicker that my smugness evaporated. I rewound the footage to take a better look. A little girl stepped out of the shadows. She walked over to my bed and stood beside me. My blood froze in my veins as I watched her lean over my sleeping body. She was inches from my face before she finally faded into mist. Dragons, unicorns, angels, demons, psychics, heaven, hell, crystals, and... Ghosts. All the things I had written off as fantasy assaulted my brain with their sheer possibility. I had to call John. I won't go into much detail about the phone call between me and John. I still have a scrap of pride left. Suffice it to say, I was in hysterics as I told him what I'd seen. To his credit, John didn't rub it in half as much as he could have. I asked him if he would be able to get rid of the ghost for me. Sorry, mate, he said. I've never been able to do that. Do you know anybody who can? I asked him as calmly as I could. In that moment, as calmly as I could meant I choked out the words between terrified sobs. Not personally, but I've had a friend with similar problems. She found a guy who exercises spirits for free. Says he got rid of a poltergeist. She gave me his number for if I ever needed it. It should be around here somewhere. It took John around 15 minutes of rummaging through his bombsite of a house before he found the number. I didn't mind, though. The idea of sharing a house with a ghost, an actual ghost, that thought was intolerable to me. I would take whatever help I could get. When he finally found the number, I thanked him profusely and wasted no time in calling it. The phone only rang three times before I got an answer. Address? The voice was cold and detached. Hello, I was hoping you could help me. I have a ghost in my house and a friend of mine told me that you deal with that sort of thing. Please, I'm... I'm terrified. The voice from the other line just simply said again, Address? He didn't seem at all interested in comforting me. There was a chilly vibe in his voice that made my hairs on my neck prickle. Still, I was desperate, so I gave him my address. I'll be there at midnight, he said, then promptly hung up. The wait was excruciating. I spent the rest of the day and evening smoking in my garden. I just couldn't bring myself to go inside my own house. Since I knew almost nothing about the war of the supernatural horrors I'd been exposed to, I had no idea if that little girl could hurt me. I don't know how I expected an exorcist to look. But when the man finally arrived, he didn't appear as I thought an exorcist would. He was no older than 30 and wore a plain white work shirt with blue jeans and black shoes. 
If anything, he looked like he belonged in a somewhat nice bar rather than a haunted house. You have a ghost problem, he said. It wasn't quite a question, and there was no uncertainty in his voice. He said it as blandly as one might say, it's raining outside. Yes, a little girl, I answered. Please, you have to help me. There was no warmth in his face as he observed me. Something about him made me uncomfortable, though I didn't know what it was at the time. Looking back, I think it was the faint trace of contempt in his eyes. I can remove the spirit for you. Do you know where it manifests itself most strongly? Yes, in my bedroom. She sometimes watches me. Watches me while I sleep. Children often have difficulty moving on. He said that as though it was one of the most normal sentences in the world. Stay here. I won't be long. With that, he left me standing outside. I lit another cigarette and tried to focus on keeping my heartbeat regular. Some part of me expected to hear the stereotypical horror movie sounds of an exorcism. Screaming, Latin chants, demonic voices, that sort of thing. None of that happened, though. It probably took no longer than ten minutes before the man came back outside. That's all? I asked. That's all. The ghost won't be troubling you anymore. Good night. And then he just left, without another word, while I stood outside my house dumbfounded. It all felt so anticlimactic, if I'm honest. A stranger arrives, spends a few minutes in my house, then leaves. Not that I'm complaining about that, mind you. It was just... It was definitely preferable to the horror movie I was anticipating. When I finally worked up the courage to go back inside, the house immediately felt different. It was lighter somehow, less oppressive. I couldn't believe how long I had endured the lingering sense of dread as I buried my head in the sand. I slept soundly that night. Maybe I could have ended the story here. I could have just gotten on with my life, content with the fact that my house was no longer haunted. Though, my damn curiosity got the better of me. You see, I remembered the camera I had set up in my bedroom. The exorcist worked so quickly that I just had to see how it was done. I wish I hadn't watched the recording. The little girl was huddled in the corner of my bedroom with her hands over her eyes. My heart raced as I looked at her, that ghost girl that had introduced me to the world of the paranormal. Then the exorcist stepped into the room and the little girl began to cry more than ever. He walked over to her and his shape began to blur. Shadows surrounded him, obscuring his features before solidifying into a spottery mass of limbs. I watched in horror as his talons lifted the girl into the air and dragged her towards him. And then I couldn't believe my eyes. The exorcist's jaw unhinged, revealing multiple rows of needle teeth. His eyes burned with pale fire as he consumed the little girl's spirit. Once he finished his meal, the shadows receded and he appeared human once more. He turned to leave, but spotted the camera. He looked straight into it, straight into me, and smiled. Ghosts are real, and I can no longer deny that. I know that there's a world besides our own. I also know that ghosts aren't the worst things out there.